Last week, I talked about being imitators of God. Do you remember that? I mentioned that to be imitators of God, you have to know God. If you don't know Him, you can't imitate Him. As believers in Christ, one of our primary objectives is to be Christ-like. You know what Christ-like means? Like Christ. In other words, we're to be imitators of Him. And so, as such, I would like to uh, to talk about one of the characteristics of Jesus, so that we can be imitators of Him. And what I'm talking about this morning is compassion. If we are to be imitators of Christ, then we must put on compassion. As Colossians 3.12 comments, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Now we're going to spend some time looking at examples in Scripture of how Jesus exercised compassion. But just so that we're on the same page as far as our understanding of compassion is concerned, there are four characteristics of compassion. And all four need to be present. The first is, compassion arises out of a need. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. There has to be a need. Something ignites it. Someone or something starts it. Secondly, the need must be recognized. Again, compassion doesn't exist in the void. It has to be seen. It has to be heard. That need needs to be recognized. So there's a need, and that need must be recognized. Thirdly, once it is recognized, it has to touch us in some kind of fashion. In other words, it has to move our hearts. So there's a need. We see this need, and we kind of feel this need. Oh my goodness. Touches us in our heart. And then the fourth step of compassion is it must take action. You can't just stop there and say, oh, I feel for this situation. It takes action. In the simplest terms, compassion is taking action upon a need that has touched our hearts. Want me to say that again? Compassion is an action upon a need that has touched our hearts. If you take away any one of these four aspects, you do not have compassion. When Jesus ministered on earth, there were needs all around him. And Jesus had the sympathetic concern for the suffering of those around him. And in addition, not only did he have this sympathetic concern, he had the desire to come to the aid of those individuals. So with this understanding in mind, I want us to look at some of the examples of how Jesus exhibited compassion so that as his followers, we can imitate that. Sound like a good idea? All right. Let's look at the first example. It comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. We read, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So Jesus begins his public ministry. It was not uncommon for him to draw large crowds. They came to hear him teach because he taught as one with authority, not like the teachers of the law. They came to be healed from their sicknesses and from their diseases. Now I suppose that you could say teaching and preaching and healing can all be expressions of compassion. But this passage gives another reason why compassion welled up in Jesus' heart. 
compassion arose because Jesus noticed that the people were harassed and hopeless. I would like to think that we all have some kind of an understanding of what harassed and helpless means in the day in which we live. Harassed has to do with being persistently troubled with petty annoyances, like political commercials, commercials on television. <laughs> helpless means unable to manage or function without help. Matthew points out how Jesus used descriptions of helpless and harassed to identify the condition of the individuals that came to him. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Now you know, I did not grow up on a farm. I did not grow up in a rural area. I have no idea how sheep are raised growing up in Chicago, but I realize that if you didn't grow up on a farm, you may not know that sheep will wander without a shepherd if they're not curtailed in some kind of manner. Therefore, when we raise sheep today on a farm, they're fenced in. They're protected so that they don't wander away. But in Jesus' day, that is not how sheep were taken care of. They often grazed in open fields under the watchful eye of a shepherd. Without shepherds, sheep wander. And then they subject themselves to numerous dangers that are in the desolate, inhospitable wilderness of the Middle East. That falls under the category harassed. Helpless describes this state, which is the end result of their wandering. They give up. They lie down in exhaustion. And Jesus looks at the crowd and he sees this need. And it touches his heart. And he takes action. He himself becomes the great shepherd. And he also encourages his disciples to also notice the same need so that they too will also have compassion. And then notice how Jesus' perspective changes from livestock to agriculture. From sheep to a field ready to be harvested. And he tells them to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. Overall, Jesus is referring to the kingdom of God, isn't he? And those that are ready to enter it, whether they are harvested in the field or whether they're brought in within the sheepfold by a shepherd. The second illustration comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 38. It's a passage in that you're familiar with. Jesus feeds miraculously 4,000 people who would come to hear him teach and to be healed. And so for three solid days, great crowds come to him and they bring him the lame, they bring him the blind, they bring him the crippled, they bring him mute individuals as well as others. And so for three days, Jesus heals them. I mean, it's amazing. The mute speak. The crippled are made well. The lame get up and walk and the blind are able to see. That doesn't get you pumped up, I don't know what will. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. And so Jesus feeds thousands that had gathered by multiplying seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. And everyone eats and eats and eats until they are well satisfied. There's a need and hunger. Jesus recognizes this need and touches his heart. He has compassion and then he takes action. Because that's how compassion unfolds. Third illustration is found in Matthew 4, verses 13 and 14. 
And this illustration deals with healing. Jesus has just received news that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded in prison. Can't imagine what that must have been like. John's disciples came and they buried his body before they went and told Jesus the news. And when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the town. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Jesus went to a solitary place to deal with the loss of a loved one. Listen, you don't go to a solitary place to hang out with other individuals. You go there to be alone. However, somehow word got out as to where Jesus was headed, and as a result, crowds followed him on foot while he traveled by boat. And when Jesus landed on shore, he saw large crowds. And what he did just amazes me. Because I think if I were in Jesus' place, going away to deal with the grief of a lost one, trying to be alone in solitude, and I get back to shore and I see crowds of people, I would have thought to myself, really? Come on, people. Can I have a moment to myself? Do you always have to come before me? But that's not the way Jesus responded. He had compassion on them. Because there was a need. There was a need to heal And Jesus recognized the need. And he took action. The fourth illustration is found in Matthew 20, verses 29 through 34. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. I mean, can you begin to imagine what it's like sitting on the side of the road, begging for money because you're unable to work because you can't see? Day after day, you have to ask for help. One day, you hear some kind of commotion and a great crowd of people you know, you can hear, are passing by you. You can't see them, but you surely can hear them. And you also hear that within that crowd, there's this guy named Jesus. He's traveling with them. You heard about him before everybody's heard about him. He cleanses lepers. He makes the lame to walk. He makes the deaf to hear. Surely he can give you sight. Even though you have one eyes. And so you decide to call out to Jesus, hoping he had not already passed by you and was beyond being able to hear your call. And you shout, Son of David, have mercy on us. because they scolded you and they told you to be quiet. But you can't be quiet, can you? I mean, if you stay quiet, how will you ever know if Jesus is there and if he's willing to heal you? So again, you shout out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And then you hear a voice. It has to be Jesus. And he asks you what you want him to do for you. Tell them that you would like to be able to see. For those of us who can see that, I don't know if we can really grasp the excitement or 
the intensity or the overwhelming joy that that man must have experienced as Jesus takes his hand and touches his eyes. And maybe that touch just sent feelings of compassion all throughout that year. There was a need. Jesus recognized the need. They touched his heart. And he took action. He took action. Let me share another example with you. This one's found in Matthew 1, verses 40 through 41. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am one, he said. Be clean. Not just so that you have a proper perspective on this encounter. Lovers were not allowed to mingle with people who did not have lovers. I mean, they were required to stay away, stay at a distance. They were practicing distancing. I'm not talking about six feet. They had to stay outside the city in their own county among themselves. They were isolated from everyone else. That individual should not have been where Jesus was. No way. Yet he broke protocol. And he crawls on his hands and knees. And he approaches Jesus. And he begs Jesus, please cleanse me. Jesus knew protocol as well. He knew the leper should not have approached him. And I suppose Jesus would have had every right to get up and back away and say, oh, oh stay away from me, buddy. You don't belong here. I suppose he could have got up and walked away, for the, away from the leper. The person was contagious. But he didn't, did he? I mean, he exercised compassion. There was a need. The need was classical. And Jesus recognized this need. And it touched his heart. And he took action. Jesus was filled with compassion and he cleansed the leper by touching him. One final example. This one's found in Luke 7, verses 11 through 15. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Jesus and a crowd of his followers approached this town of Colony, where they encounter a funeral procession. Great group of individuals walking out. Someone from the crowd must have noticed this other crowd that was coming into the city. Someone must have been asked from this crowd, what's going on? Someone from the funeral procession must have informed them what was going on. This widow, who had already lost her husband, just lost her one and only son. The only living person in her immediate family. And Jesus noticed that the woman was crying. Wouldn't you? The woman had lost her one and only son. And when Jesus saw the woman, his heart went out to her. I wonder if Jesus was thinking about how the God, how God the Father, so loved the world that he gave his one and only son who would take the sins of the world and carry it all the way to the cross, where he himself would die, so that those sins would be paid in full, saving those 
And sadly, sin distorted that relationship. Leaving behind. Avoid. And so we chase after all kinds of things looking to fill that void. The only way that relationship can be restored is what? Through Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So those who come to Christ will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. They will not have to look for someone or something to fill that hole. As far as healing goes, our greatest need but is not physical healing. And his greatest need is spiritual healing. Those who are not in Christ have a terminal sin disease. They can't stop it. They cannot heal it. For the wages of sin is death. Physical as well as spiritual. One death is temporary. The other is everlasting. The only way one can be healed is by coming to Jesus. For he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. There's that shepherd imagery again. Jesus. Bring spiritual healing, doesn't Our wandering, our hunger, our need for healing can be remedied by coming to Jesus. Many will not recognize their need. Many will not recognize their helplessness, their hunger, their terminal condition. Because sin has so blinded their spiritual eyes that unless God intervenes and opens their eyes, they'll forever remain in spiritual darkness. However, God had an action plan that was formulated before the creation of the world, before God even spoke creation into being. He had a plan to redeem a people for himself. His plan was to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith. Spiritual blindness is far worse than physical blindness. One is temporary at best other has everlasting consequences. As far as cleansing is concerned, spiritual cleansing is far more important than the need for physical cleansing. Again, one is temporary at best, but the other has everlasting consequences. Scripture tells us how much more then will the blood of Jesus Christ do through the eternal spirit Offer himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. <clears throat> Jesus said that we, God's word said that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleansing comes through the shed blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no cleansing, no forgiveness of sin. And then finally, there's a need for new life to be brought back from the dead. New life can only come through Jesus Christ, who said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in who sent me, as eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. 
Jesus died so that we may live. Through him, we died to sin. Through his resurrection, we were raised to a new life, as Romans 6, 4 points out. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Jesus had compassion on you, didn't he? We've clearly seen that. His compassion was expressed in the physical realm, and it was expressed in the spiritual realm. And as holy and dearly loved children of God, we must clothe ourselves with compassion. As imitators of Christ, we too must express compassion, physically as well as spiritually. The needs are all around us. All around us. Jesus often felt a sympathetic concern for the suffering of people that he saw, which included a desire to come to the aid of the individual. And the compassion that Jesus felt must be the same compassion we must feel. If we choose to be in the figures of that. So feed the hungry. Heal the sick. Open your eyes to the suffering all around you and come to their aid. And don't forget the spiritual needs as well. Point those in need to the good shepherd, to the bread of life, to the one who can heal our soul. To the one who opens us spiritually blind eyes. To the one who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. To the one who raises us from spiritual death to new life. Be imitators of Christ. Clothe yourself with compassion. Let's spend some time in prayer, praying that we may 